do you think it's appropriate for the podcast to give a shout out to the Steelers? Is that playing favorites? I mean, all of the Bosnian underworld is into American football. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, we can have a podcast favorite team. I mean, you know. I mean, we can. Uh, I mean, we've already mentioned uh, George. I know, was thinking about the yeah, George Musulin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's give a little shout out here to uh, the Steelers for their opening game. Yes. Uh, AFC North rivalry. Uh, <laughs> fucking Cincinnati versus Pittsburgh. Yeah. It was uh, really great. And the whole time I was thinking about OSS operative George Musulin. Yes. And <laughs> how he was an early pioneer for this heroic team. <laughs> Yeah, well, what a big galoot that guy was, you know, yeah. <laughs> looking at him. Man. Yeah, he played, what, tackle, I he think? He had for... to, come on, he's not, uh, you know, he's not a fucking running back, he's a massive man. No, he's, he's a big dude. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was actually a lot of fun. I I haven't watched uh, American football in, I think, a couple of years, really. Uh, yeah. So yesterday was, was kind of fun. Very exciting. Very entertaining game. Lots of unexpected things. Really nice to see a, a Texas boy save the day at the end. There felt some uh, felt some local pride and, there, and and seeing Pittsburgh demolish fucking uh, Cincinnati in Cincinnati. Yeah, that was, was yeah, also quite nice because yeah. <laughs> they were highly favored. I, I, I it came to the point where like the refs kept on like calling penalties on the Steelers, and I was like, dude, there's so no. much money riding on this right yes. now. They're like, score a point, win the game. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, millions of dollars at stake. Nope. So, uh... Welcome to the Empire Never Ended. <laughs> Sports talk with Boris Fritz and Ray. I should have recorded that. I was I was yelling, yelling <laughs> at the television. I'm sure you were. Was, <laughs> yeah, we we had some guests over as well that are friends of this podcast. I think both of them have appeared at some point or another uh-huh. in very limited capacity. Yeah, so, uh, lots of shouting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and also, if you're following Eurobasket, Serbia got eliminated by Italy. Right. Uh, which was kind of disappointing because they were doing pretty well there with uh, all those NBA players. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> there you go. I, th- I think that leaves, uh, I think only Croatia's left. Or they might have been eliminated as well. Bosnia got eliminated. So, ex Yugoslavia not looking great. Slovenia's still there. Uh huh. All We're right. still in it. So <laughs> let's uh let's we can root for Doncic there. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a spin-off. We'll have a spin-off sports uh, sports talk episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll call the Schlock up. That's right. Buck Schlock by Schlockminster. Buck Schlockminster, right? uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh yeah, sports talk, Tenopod, George Musuling, there's the connection. OSS oh, yeah. to the topic today. Which is actually uh, off, kind of off topic in a way. We're we're sort of taking a, a a little break from the Balkans today to set up some sort of backstory. Well, I mean, it's 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 not super off off topic. You know, we we're, we're big fans of context here. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. This, yeah, we're broadening <laughs> the scope a bit to sort of give the background on our episodes that we've done about HUAC the House on American Activities Committee, as well as episodes we're going to be doing about, like, anti-communists. So we're doing a background on background episodes now. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. But it's also, <laughs> it's also background for what's to come. Mm-hmm. So uh, especially because this will be a two-part look. Uh, Maybe even three-part, no? Well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> I'm not sure how much time Ray's comfortable spending away from the the homeland. <laughs> Oh come on, we we gotta you know the the CIA is that's that's you know the meat and potatoes here. Yeah, this is where we're gonna get out the like the big like Glenn Beck chalkboard and start yeah, yeah, like, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. making connections. Yeah, and, this is this is also a big step on the way to Tenepod like completely losing itself in a uh, chalkboard nonsense eventually, which we all know we'll have to do. <laughs> well, we we have to do a whole arc basically on what's the topic of today's episode eventually. I think. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and dried out. So this is, uh, you see, this is, it's, it's very relevant. It's got a lot of connections here. So we got to do the big reveal. What are we talking about? We're talking about <laughs> the Gellin organization today. Hmm. And its impact on the sort of post-war anti-communist uh, hardcore alignment that the U.S. ended up with, and also the source of the kind of popular American imagination about the communist threat as well. Uh, he, this, this guy, Reinhard Gellin, who we'll be focusing mostly on today, was enormously influential in how the Cold War played out. So the Gellin organization is, of course, the first West German post-Second World War intelligence organization. And the, the, the modern one kind of grew out of it. And the BND, yeah. Yes. yeah. And of course, Gellin and, and all of them were a bunch of Nazis. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Nazis is putting it lightly, as we will see today. Yeah. So and like real deal Nazis. Oh my like, god, you know, these people were psychopaths. We're, we're calling people Nazis who who aren't Nazis. Oh no, there's I, no well actually here. No, no. These people are just straight up Nazis. These, yeah, these were Nazis. <laughs> Very important Nazis. Uh, all right. Yeah. So just to sort of say in, in general what's going on today, uh, I'm looking at a book by Christopher Simpson, and it's called uh, "Blowback: America's Recruitment of Nazis and Its Effects on the Cold War," and it, from 1988. It's part of I think a trilogy of really interesting fucking books um, from this uh, historian and journalist, Christopher Simpson. So we are skipping over quite a lot from this book. We're, I'm just going to focus on Gellin today, and next time we come back, we're going to talk about uh, uh, Operation Bloodstone and uh, rat lines and stuff like that. But this is leading up to this. So we're also... It's a, it's a very long book. It's quite detailed. Yeah, yeah. It's very, uh, yeah. despite that, it's very readable. It's an excellent book. Yeah. Um, yeah. We are skipping over a few things that the book covers really well, like uh, Operation Overcast and Paperclip, like mm. the, which just to give a little bit of background was to steal these Nazi scientists away from the clutches of the Red Army, you know, but like capturing Nazi war criminal scientists and putting them to work on future, you know, <laughs> war crimes for America was like an extremely important operation that sort of opened a lot of this other stuff up and uh, led to the creation of NASA and yada, yada, yada. A lot of people know this story already. Yeah, Paperclip, I think, is probably one of the more familiar ones. Yeah. If not only because like Werner von Braun was like, made fun of a lot in like the 60s sure you know? <laughs> like it's, i mean it became kind of like this archetype yeah you know, like yes like dr strangelove or whatever. exactly right yeah. yeah um importantly for this episode though all of that opened up the field legally for for all these other nazis to slip in uh not related to science at all just straight up fucking holocausting nazis you know i think this is what um i ended the uh, like the mccarthy episode talking a little bit about some of those CIA programs to bring over the, like, you know, as many anti-communist uh, immigrants as possible. Right. Right. Yeah. And uh, th th this, this book actually talks a lot about that. Like, uh, yeah, like especially in the, yeah. uh, the follow-up to this episode, we're going to get deeper into that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So this episode's going to focus on the Gellin organization and how a scrappy, band of only about 4,000 fucking Nazis working for the U.S. government with a meager budget of $200 million um, in like the late 40s managed to push the U.S. into the Red Scare. And, mm. you know, and later, I mean, their influence extends to the Cuban Missile Crisis, too. So, I mean, also to the brink of nuclear war and shit. Also the Mussolini connection there. Yeah, yes, exactly. It's part of this arc, uh, like I said, because it's sort of the first step towards that, you know, more chalkboard type Gladio-like shit that will increasingly appear on the show, uh, as well as the sort of, I mean, like the nail in the coffin, really, on socialist resistance to fascism in the U.S., you know, during the Cold right. War that we've already dealt a lot about. And I mean, all these CIA guys are com fucking complete freaks. Yes. Like, yeah. uh, y you know, you can pick an event in the Cold War and then just like look into it and you'll find some like absolute like comic book character villain. Yeah. Like in some desk in fucking DC. Oh my God. We're going to talk about this Nazi who goes by Dr. Six today. I mean, <laughs> these are. Exactly. <laughs> what the fuck? Unreal. Uh, so Reinhard Gellin, he was this weaselly little Prussian 
prick who headed up the Foreign Armies East, which uh, we'll call FHO. It's often called just Ost. Um, and he built up this intelligence network in the Soviet Union, providing a, a wealth of data to the Third Reich, obtained, of course, through torture and, you know, the murder of <laughs> millions of people, really. Gelin worked <laughs> with some of the worst, like, slimiest people in the SD, uh, which was the uh, German intelligence under the SS. SD, right. do you know how to say what their German fucking name? It's Sieg, Siegerheis. Well, Siegerheis Dienst, Dienst, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. That's why everybody just calls it SD. Well, it's because it's one of those great, like, compound words, too. It has, yes. like, like, 47 letters to, <laughs> in, like, one word. Yes. <laughs> yes. God damn it. Uh, so the FHO was apparently subordinated uh, throughout the early career of Gellin to uh, Department 6, Amt 6 of, of, of SS headquarters. Gellin rose to the rank of Major General by the war's end. And I think I wanted to just start with a quote from Christopher Simpson here that describes Richard Gellin's wartime activities, because we're not really going to be spending much time on that. Uh, he writes, Gellin's men were, in a sense, like scientists who skimmed off the information and documents that rose to the surface of these pestilent camps. Now and again, they selected an interesting specimen, a captured Russian general ready to collaborate, perhaps, or a Ukrainian railroad expert who might supply the locations of vulnerable bridges when given some encouragement to talk. Gellin's officers were scientists in somewhat the same way that concentration camp doctors were. Both groups extracted their data from the destruction of human beings. And despite, you know, Hitler's just deep hatred of the Slavs and kind of lack of desire to see a unified Slavic army built, he nonetheless allowed Gellin and his associates, particularly uh, Wilfried Strick Strickfeld, to start dumping money on and managing the propaganda for what would become known as the Russian Liberation Army under right. Soviet defector, uh, kind of half, half-hearted half Nazi ally, Andrei Vlasov. Who we talked about in our um, episode about the spin-off Orthodox churches, because uh, Vlasov also has, I mean, the whole ROA has uh, an interesting connection to interwar Yugoslavia, too. Mm. At this time, his forces consisted largely of like opportunists that were like taken out of camps and like even like mercenaries, more than like diehard Nazi ideologues that would really kind of sell this plan, you know? So uh, the SS like shored up its numbers with hand picked psychopaths of their own and, and sort of kept it uh, a sort of SS controlled uh, army in, uh, on the Eastern Front. There are also modern Russian Nazis that go by the ROA, uh, some of whom are fighting uh, in Ukraine right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, using the same insignia and name and whatever. Yeah. So by this plan's fruition, by Gelin's plan's fruition here in about 42, there were two, two main schools of thought prevailing here at the time, apart from just like kill everyone being like plan one. Um, but one plan was to establish national liberation movements, they were called this, all over the Soviet sphere of influence and wage a political war uh, instead of necessarily like dumping blood on everything, you know, while the other idea was to centralize all of these political movements underneath Vlasov's banner and create like mm -hmm. this super army to absorb all those bullets, you know, and save all the good methy German blood for breeding Nazi meth babies. And the decentralizers included Alfred Rosenberg of the Eastern Ministry, who saw nationalism specifically as a bulwark against Jewish Bolshevism. Bolshev God, I can never say Bolshevism. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> always say Bolshevism. Uh, Don't you mean Bolshevismos? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jewish, Jewish Bolshevism on the one hand and Russian imperialism on the other hand. And Gelin's buddies, the SS, the Abwehr, the Foreign Office and all this, wanted their impressionable defector Vlasov to lead the whole lot as like a meat wall, basically, to hide behind, you know. And, <laughs> and neither side, though, really got what they wanted in the end. Uh, total war ended up shutting down Rosenberg's Eastern Office and then Vlasov... Uh, actually betrayed the Nazis towards the end of the war. And like Hitler didn't have a lot of patience apparently for Slavic shit in general and uh, allegedly fired Reinhard Gellin shortly before the Fuhrer's hilarious death. 
and uh, <laughs> the admixture of Nazis and especially SS operatives in the Vlasov army, as well as the like Banderas Ukrainian nationalist movement, in conjunction with Gelen and companies like Vast Network of torturers and murderers and snitches, all of that stuff made Nazi intelligence an object of deep, deep envy uh, of American intelligence. Mm-hmm. There's um, like they would, sh- you know, they were right down the street from each other in the 30s in Moscow in their respective embassies, and even then. Uh, uh, George Kennan from like this, went this like intellectual architect of a lot of Cold War policy. Uh, George Kennan was writing like, "Oh man, these fucking Nazis are pretty awesome. <laughs> we all like to hang out, and their intelligence is just amazing." And the early U.S. intelligence in the '30s was trying to keep up with like Nazi intelligence already in the '30s. You know, there's, so there's this kind of cozy relationship goes far back. Um, Reinhardt already had one foot out the door in 44. Uh, he was like a Soviet expert, you know, and he was less than confident, therefore, of the Fuhrer's ability to defeat the Red Army and also really well aware of the, the value that his files would have in the post-war international order. And so in 1945, Gellin and his closest officers went ahead and microfilmed everything they could from FHO headquarters and stored the film in these steel drums squirreled away in the meadows of the Austrian Alps. How romantic. Two months later, he surrendered to the uh, CIC, the American Counterintelligence Corps, specifically to a guy named Captain John Balker. And Balker was a POW in a German camp and was, was well-treated and generally believed that Germans were not really respected as a people and thought that this was unfortunate. He thought that they were, like, pretty great and was very willing to look past massive war crimes um, to make like collegiate relationships with these like people like uh, Gellin. So um, Balker also thought communists were terrible and were going to take over the world. So he really liked it when Gellin showed up with like a shit ton of information on the Soviet Union and uh, had a lot of answers for how to, how to handle this, this coming threat. Uh, there was a little problem, though with Captain John Balker and Gellin, and that is something called the Yalta Agreement, which required U.S. forces to give USSR any prisoners of war obtained in the Eastern Front, like our boy here, Reinhardt. Uh, now, that goes back to, like, Paperclip as well and Overcast. This was a huge point of contention, and it did irrevocable damage to Soviet-U.S. relations, this exact thing. So Balker decides instead to... To, le- to go out of the CIC and leak this to General Edwin Siebert, who was the highest ranking intelligence officer in the U.S. Army in Europe at the time, as well as a guy named Bedell Smith, who was the Supreme Allied Command Chief of Staff. So Bakker impressed upon these men the need to absorb this wealth of German intelligence in the Soviet Union that, and that Gellin, in particular, and his associates were essential to this task. Meanwhile, the OSS was also wise to the plan. Uh, a double agent for the OSS and the uh, German Foreign Office, the FHO, told wild Bill Donovan and Alan Dulles about Gellin's plans, and they sent out this sexy Wall Street lawyer named Frank Weisner, who also happened to be a, like a spy in Istanbul and Bucharest before to build a direct line to the, the waif like Reinhard Gellin. And uh, Weisner himself would later go on to help found the CIA and then off himself in the 1960s. So, nice. uh, yeah. So Bakker's U.S. Yeah, Army... Yeah, he's one of these names that are always mentioned when you talk about the CIA and their kind yeah. of inner, inner circle. Like, basically, you know, with Alan Dallas and Angleton. Yeah. And those are the people that, you know, people believe they killed JFK and such things. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wait, sorry, was that other guy's name Bettle? Bettle is his first name, yeah. Bettle. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> these guys have, like, weird-ass names. Something yeah. Fun. <laughs> yeah, Edwin Edwin Bettel together here. Regular regular Revlo P. Oliver. Yes. <laughs> yes. So General Siebert, the U.S. Army intelligence guy, took Gellin and his three amigos to D.C., where they were debriefed in August of 45. His superiors were very impressed and didn't seem to mind that the guy's methods were based on, uh, this is a quote from Simpson, the torture, interrogation, and murder by starvation of some four million Soviet prisoners of war. 
Uh, and Siebert was given broad authority to finance and employ Gellin's little group to continue plying their trade now for the U.S. Uh, if shit went down, if there was a scandal, the blame would be at Siebert's feet, Edwin, and the U.S. government would just leave him out to dry. So between Siebert's U.S. Army intelligence and Donovan and Dulles's OSS, Gellin and most of the FHO high command had been freed from captivity um, and resumed exactly what they had been doing before and during the war as Nazis, now working for U.S. intelligence. And just to make it all too obvious, their office was set up in the old Waffen-SS training facility uh, outside of Pulk, Germany, which would remain their headquarters until 2017. <laughs> nice. <laughs> wow. Yes. Uh, so stay tuned for the end of that. But uh, right. Those hallowed halls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um. And what about the Vlasov army, right? So this was a massive Nazi collaborator force, around 120,000 strong, littered with SS operatives and like psychopathic local anti-communists that even the Nazis thought were a little much. Uh, like these were the sorts of people that Nazis would assign in like Ukraine to for like the firing squads that executed children. Right. Uh, they were commie children, though, so no harm, no foul, as far as America's or, concerned. Or Jews. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, of course, the U.S. became Vlasov's army's new patron uh, through yep. the Gellin Group, as well as a patron of the Ukrainian insurgent army. You know, these Banderas who hunted down thousands of Jews, stirred up pogroms where many thousands more were murdered. Uh, they, were, they operated as like an auxiliary police during the Holocaust, you know, for the Nazis. Uh, these guys were all now getting covert funding through the Gellin organization. Gellin also arranged U.S. support for numerous other anti-communist exile groups all around Europe, Eastern Europe especially, that he had previously organized as a Nazi. However, these would no longer really be considered armies necessarily, but more like informer networks and clandestine guerrilla groups kind of waiting in the wings for the scene to start. So by 1947, Gellin and U.S. intelligence had almost completely rebuilt Berlin's command line over its old network of wartime collaborationist assets of like Nazi emigres and emigres and defectors and whatnot from uh, like Soviet defectors. So to manage this network, Gellin's organization, as it was now called, or just org, the org, yeah, uh, employed two SS veterans. Uh, this is now while they're working for the U.S., these guys were named Franz Six, there's your Dr. Six, and Emil Ausberg, also Dr. Ausberg. So both Six and Ausberg were veterans of Department Six, Amt Six, no relation to Franz Six, of the Nazis' SS headquarters. And by war's end, the department had absorbed both the FHO, um, Gellin's, or uh, the one that Gellin had uh, headed, as well as like Abwehr military intelligence and a large portion as well of, of the domestic intelligence network of the Nazis. So when the U.S. began working for Gellin, he brought in as many of these people as he possibly could. And these were like saboteurs and spies and propagandists, fucking torturers and death squad leaders and people like that, rescuing like quite a lot of them from almost certain execution from for war crimes. But all that U.S. intelligence cared about was like the unrivaled mountain of data on the Soviet Union that came with these people. So I mentioned war crimes. So now the, the fellas managing the recruitment of all these Nazis and collaborators have a pretty long resume. Uh, both Franz Six and Emil Ausberg commanded mobile killing squads on the Eastern Front. Franz Six, mm. who lived until 1975, was called uh, uh, a Streber, uh, like mm. a... Like a what? Like a nerd? A nerd? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> by uh, by Eichmann because he like enthusiastically tackled the Jewish question with such like you know fucking methodical zeal. Or there something. you go, methodical zeal. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, he was a personal favorite of his own boss Himmler in the SS. He he didn't. He had no soul in his in the implementation of the Holocaust. You know, he didn't buy the it. book. Like, uh, <laughs> yes. like a fucking nerd. Like you know? a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But I, you know, Eichmann meant it as a compliment because yeah. that's how they all liked it. Mm. Eichmann gave Franz Six personal command over the ideological combat section of the SD in his first like organized steps towards the, the Holocaust. And Six was part of an intelligence and extermination squad called Vorkommando Moscow in advance of the Nazi invasion. 
of the Soviet Union who have been ordered to like go into Moscow and strip the NKVD archives and of any information and murder any Soviet official they found along the way. And Six and his team didn't quite get to Moscow in the end, but they did manage to murder 200 people in Smolensk where they stopped on the way. So he was really like the full Nazi package here, you know. He wasn't right. just a murderer. He was also a blowhard. And he spoke at conferences on the Jewish question. He argued that the physical elimination of Eastern Jewry would deprive Jewry of its biological reserves. The Jewish question must be solved not only in Germany, but also internationally. He was a, a, a public intellectual, in fact, uh, giving academic sort of a veneer of academic credibility to this stuff. Um, Himmler was so horny over this speech that he <laughs> took Fran Six out of Department Six and gave him his own department. So not Department Six, but this is Six's department. Uh, and it was Department 7. So 6 left 6 for 7, if you're confused. But he still went by 6. Well, that's his name. <laughs> it's his actual name. His he actual just, name is He six. grew up with a deeply evil name. <laughs> yes. Yes. Dr. 6. Dr. Uh, Dr. 6 is now in command of Unit 7. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, Amt 7. Yeah. Amt 7. So before Six was gleefully murdering people in Russia, though, he was a pre-war college professor. And because of this, he insisted throughout his life on being called Dr. Six. So he was like, <laughs> yeah. Titles are important. <laughs> Very, yes. Yes. It's a real doctorate. I wrote my dissertation. I wrote my dissertation on the Jewish, like, <laughs> yes. Jewish question. God damn it. Call me doctor. Oh, my God. Yes. Uh, so, and yeah, you've got to imagine. I mean, that's what these fucking, you know, pre-CIA guys called him too, you know. Uh, I mean, he's literally like an Indiana Jones villain at this point. Mm -hmm. He's a Nazi yeah. college professor. Um, he was one of those... Uh, so, okay, so what did he do when he joined Department 6? Not 7, this is 6. He created the, the Vanse Institute, uh, WANSE, if you're uh, speaking, speaking American at it, which was like a very fancy SS think tank. And they ran it like an anti-communist kind of area studies program, collecting all these ethnographic uh -huh. reports on Eastern Europe's kind of diverse population. Right. Uh, didn't a lot of, like a lot of German universities, area studies departments were founded by Nazis to like gather demographic I'm, information, right? And yeah. Like, uh, Kemal has talked to me about this before, actually. I think I, from in the U.S., it's no different. I mean, you know, area studies is a, a favorite of the CIA and stuff like that. I mean, it's right been right. long linked to these to these kinds of powers. Uh, so yeah, Wannsee Institute was the Nazis' one, and uh, it, the Wannsee Institute and, and where it was. I mean, it was like in this beautiful, whatever, natural area around this lake and um, the Wannsee and. This was where the final solution to the Jewish question was officially laid out by by another Reinhard, a Heydrich founder of the S, of the SD. Uh, so this is like a very important place that was run by six, where like mm. both the final solution was formalized as well as you know given academic legitimacy by inviting all these professors and experts and whatnot there to produce like research. So basically, yeah, this guy's like a perfect recruit for the burgeoning U.S. deep state getting hard over the prospect of a prolonged Cold War coming. And as I said, Six was, was one of the very, very first recruits into the Gellin organization. And unfortunately for him, one of his own recruits, one of, one of Six's recruits, was a former SS guy named Hirschfeld who was working for the CIC as a double agent during their Nazi hunting period. And, uh, and this was in conjunction with, with British intelligence as well. So they didn't have as much like leeway as they might have otherwise. So this dude fingers Fran Six as being like a fucking war criminal. And, uh, and this becomes like a huge story in the press. So all that like Edwin Siebert and Bill Donovan and Alan Dulles and these guys, all they can do is sort of watch quietly from the sidelines and hope it like begins and ends with him. So Six goes to trial and he's convicted before an American military tribunal for the massacre in Smolensk, among many, many other things, and sentenced to 20 years. Uh, Six pleads innocent and he pleads ignorant throughout his trial and his imprisonment. Which, of course, only lasts four years because... The, oh, damn. Yes, <laughs> for, yes, for massacring a village. Because the U.S. High Commissioner in Germany, whose name is John McCloy, granted him a blanket, a, a blanket clemency. 
And this mm. clemency meant that now legally he could resume work for the Gellin organization as like an employee. Um, I didn't really mention this, but the key requirement for importing these strategically important foreign nationals into the U.S. was that they were officially cleared of culpability in the Holocaust. And mm -hmm. as you could see, that wasn't all that hard to do. And this, this does go back to like Operation Paperclip and all of that, where they had to figure out how to make these guys who like worked hundreds of people to death at like Nordhausen, you know, to make rockets for slaughtering British citizens into these American heroes like Werner von Braun and, and Walter Dornberger and these guys. So, so that, that kind of foundation was already laid, um, this like bureaucratic way of erasing war crimes to get people mm -hmm. in. So, interesting side note here, though, later on, Franz Six testified against Eichmann at his trial. Uh, he was supposed mm. to be a witness for the defense, but he ended up just laying it all out. At this time, Six had retired from the Gellin organization was, and was working as an ad executive for Porsche, um, which he did until he retired. Eichmann, at the same time, was a department head for Daimler-Benz in Buenos Aires, which was Porsche's corporate rival. So, interesting. Side note there. Two Nazis representing luxury car companies at a war crimes trial. Goddamn. Yeah. So uh, you can tell Franz Six landed pretty well in the end. I think he died in like this, the late 70s or something like that. Uh, Emil Ausberg, he was the other guy with the doctorate who was in Six's ideological combat section of the SD. He was well known for attacking rivals inside the SS by claiming that they're Jews one of these classy dudes. He also led a death squad in Russia that achieved, quote, extraordinary results um, in mass murdering people. Mm. And also, like Six, a director at Vanze and specialized in high-level Soviet targets of assassination, work that Christopher Simpson says he later continued for the United States within the Gellin organization. Mm. So, Ausberg stayed out of the spotlight, unlike Fritz, oh, Franz, <laughs> 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 whoops um don't implicate yourself <laughs> yes <It's gone. laughs> uh okay alsberg stayed out of the spotlight uh never became a public intellectual like franz six did in germany but he was widely regarded within those circles as one of the foremost experts on eastern europe and so alongside also his post-war day job that he got with gellin Ausberg simultaneously worked for the CIC, he worked for French intelligence, and, quote, a private network of ex-SS officers headed by former SS General Bernau. But uh, perhaps the most important thing for us is that he worked in a U.S. group called Technical Intelligence Branch that was supposedly only interested in finding German scientists, but in fact was basically a Nazi laundering service for American intelligence, where they would they would pull uh, German intelligence agents out of whatever, wherever they were, and redeploy them for the U.S. So Augsburg specialized in collecting these emigres and defectors from the Soviet Union uh, and turning them into these like brutal interrogators and spies and whatnot uh, to mm. fight, you know, in the Cold War. Augsburg lived until the 80s, um, completely yeah. happy. Yeah. So I think the thing here now uh that i want to impress on the listener is that this isn't just like a you know oh the u.s worked with nazis episode because that's not really a shock <laughs> at this point yeah um, well, especially but, not to our <laughs> listeners I yes think pretty yeah, aware yeah, yeah. Of that. uh the thing I, I i wanted to set up these figures more so that first of all you can see how nazi gellin was uh the mm -hmm. gellin organization was how how like pure that pedigree of theirs is but now I want to explain sort of the impact that these guys had on uh, the American side of the Cold War and the culture in general, really. So, so yeah, basically, again, this is this kind of accompanies our stuff on whack and the McCarthy period and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so let's call this, this last part here, Gellin's impact on American life. This will be the second half of the episode. Writing now in 1988 in this book, uh, Simpson says this, of all the networks of former Nazis and collaborators employed by the United States after World War II, it is Gellin's organization that has left the most substantial imprint on the United States. Gellin's analysis of the forces that guide Soviet behavior, which were forged in part by his personal defeat at the hands of the Russians during World War II, became widely accepted in U.S. intelligence circles and remains so to this day. So just to say that what's going to happen now 
uh, stayed the norm until at least the late eight, until the end of the Cold War. So this is right. really a definitive moment for, for the decades to follow the, the Second World War. Right. His main contribution was the conflation of political communism with the assumption that there is an imminent military threat to the West. His organization essentially legitimized through intelligence gathering, through, through supposed facts, that the, there was this grand communist conspiracy after all, uh, to take over every single labor union and school and church and then attack in like a, a military kind of guerrilla fashion from inside. And that this was like what they were set to do. So as we'll see, though, Gellin's organization fabricated this view of post-war Soviet military as being something that's super overpowered, really ready to go, like basically all the stuff that my parents and their parents thought <laughs> was going on, that stuff was all totally from Nazis. Um, Gellin working through the deep state, the legislature, the media did really what American fascists like Henry Ford and Charles Coughlin and these guys kind of failed to do in the end, which was to help turn the vast majority of the population into fucking anti-communist lunatics, you know, <laughs> like right. this was, this was Gellin's victory that these guys didn't entirely share. I mean, I think this, uh, yeah, I mean, they greatly overestimated Soviet military power, but then also like, I think this is kind of where you get some of those characterizations as like, uh, you know, that you saw in the media of like, you know, Russian soldiers being kind of like invincible supermen yeah. who are also like, you know, dumb as dirt and their country's poor and shitty, but like they have like the best military technology and, you know, they know everything. Well, when Rocky defeated the Soviet Union in <laughs> personal combat, that's the image that uh, comes from these fucking Nazis. Yeah. So this image that Gellin will manage to make that I'm going to explain now was created at least in part out of the usual bureaucratic defensive necessity to survive, you know, like Gellin and his organization of war criminals were only putting food on the table by the good graces of the U.S. government, who was dumping massive amounts of money into this. And powerful defenders of Gellin's, like Alan Dulles, were able to continue to justify their employment of these Nazis only because the Soviet Union was thought to pose an existential danger to the United States, and it made it a lot easier for people to look the other way when you're working up and down the chain, like in the legislature, in the military, wherever. So, I mean, like it always goes with, with like bureaucrats, like Nazi or not, if you want to keep your job, you've got to prove that it's necessary. So how did he manage this? So the former CIA spy chief within the post-war Soviet Union was a man named Harry uh, Rositsky, and Simpson quotes him as saying this. Um, you know what, Boris? I'm going to give you the old American military fuddy-duddies. In 1946, U.S. intelligence files on the Soviet Union were virtually empty. Even the most elementary facts were unavailable, on roads and bridges, on the location and production of factories, on city plans and airfields. Yeah, so they, they had very little. So I've already mentioned that Gellin brought with him like a wealth of intelligence data from the USSR, but I didn't really emphasize how shitty U.S. intelligence was on it. And like I said, like as far back as the 30s, you know, U.S. intelligence has been deeply jealous of Nazi intelligence on the Soviet Union. And um, we're not really going to, you know, talk about George Kennan here that much, but I mean, he's a huge part of this story as well. Um, but... The point is that German intelligence was not only like respected by American intelligence, but as if you're going to, you know, wage a Cold War now, it was desperately, desperately needed because the U.S. knew fuck all about their new, you know, their new enemy. And Gellin claimed to know everything. So when, when the CIA was founded in 47, its first chief, who we've actually mentioned before as a founding board member of NICAP, for all you ufologists out there, uh, this yeah. was Rear Admiral Roscoe H. Hillencotter. He would just fucking straight up retype. I know. <laughs> I know. I love the name. I'm trying I'm to sorry. get through some of them without giggling, but man, <sighs> Roscoe. Roscoe Hillencotter. Uh, he would. Hillencotter. He would just basically retype Gellin's intelligence reports onto CIA stationery. Like, that's literally what he would do and give it to Truman without qualifying its source and just be like, this is what the CIA says. So, whatever Gellin sent them, anything Gellin sent them would be included in the CIA's morning briefings as fact. Uh, and Gellin 
entire Gellin's organization entirely shaped the CIA's understanding of Eastern Europe um, at its at its inception. So reflecting on this period, uh, Simpson quotes a former CIA chief analyst on Soviet strategic war plans and capabilities as saying this. You get to say tits here, Boris. All right. <laughs> Gellin had to make his money by creating a threat that we were afraid of, so we would give him more money to tell us about it. In my opinion, the Gellin organization provided nothing worthwhile for understanding or estimating Soviet military or political capabilities in Eastern Europe or anywhere else. Employing Gellin was a waste of time, money, and effort, except that maybe he had some counterintelligence value. Because practically everybody in his organization was sucking off both tits. Thank you. <laughs> so what tits? <laughs> what tits, you might be asking? Well... Uh, Gellin's organization. Sorry, that had sucking off and tits into <laughs> yes. one thing. <laughs> it's the perfect thing to give me to read. You're welcome. I thought of you. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah. So, what tits is he talking about? What tits was he sucking off? Sucking off. <laughs> yes. The Gellin organization was also rife with perfectly competent. Soviet doubled agents who fed information on U.S. intelligence gathering and military capabilities back to Moscow through channels that Gellin accidentally opened up. So, like, despite their wartime reputation, the U.S. sponsored Gellin organization was really like like a leaky garbage barge of shitty intelligence that mostly just allowed <laughs> Soviet intelligence to get a much better picture on the U.S. than the U.S. would ever have on the Soviet Union. So uh, the first reports to come out of East Germany from 1945 were not Gellin's, though, but U.S. Army intelligence. They reported accurately that the Red Army was tearing up railroad tracks and other infrastructural materials and shipping them back to Russia as war reparations, making large-scale transportation increasingly difficult, like in, in East Germany. Uh, their numbers were quite high, like around 200 divisions, but their actual power, U.S. intelligence said, was extremely diminished by just physical exhaustion, as well as complex administration and reconstruction efforts in their zone of operation. So considering like the centrality of rail transport to past Soviet strategy, the report concluded that Russian aggression against Western Europe would not even be possible for another decade, if even that. Gellin was saying the exact opposite, right? Like, uh -huh. uh, in, uh, his, his response to this was to spend two years and m tens of millions of dollars uh, creating an exhaustive reappraisal of the Soviet military might in East Germany to, to like take over this US, intel U.S. Army intelligence report and sort of like put it out of sight, out of mind, you know. So this is Simpson writing. By the time the reappraisal was over, it had become an article of faith in Washington, D.C. that the war-weary Soviet occupation forces were actually fresh assault troops poised for an attack on the West. The Americans' new estimate of the number of those troops, furthermore, was greatly exaggerated because it did not take into account the large-scale demobilizations of Soviet forces after 1945. So as U.S. intelligence's primary source of information on the Soviet military during this pivotal period in the Cold War, Gellin's organization played an important role in the creation of American evaluations, or rather misevaluations of Soviet power in Europe that had not been adequately appreciated until now. Um, meaning... Uh, yeah, that bit, okay, so Gellin's data was woefully out of date intentionally to artificially inflate these things and say, like, basically highly trained, super ready shock troops are ready to go at any minute. So back in 1945, when Gellin was initially making these, like, first arguments, uh, when the U.S. Army Intelligence Report came out, uh, the OSS was still around, but not, not long for this world, and Gellin's presence in some ways kind of triggered the ultimate demise of the OSS as well. And, uh, and it, you know, and the birth of the CIA. So, so Pentagon military intelligence, MIS, was in 45, relying on Gellin's information to present their intelligence, right? Uh, OSS, Research and Analysis Group, thought that the Pentagon's intelligence service was full of shit, and that their source of information was at best questionable. And none of none of the OSS's information indicated anything that the Red Army was like anything other than tired and bogged down. And there was definitely no imminent attack planned on Western Germany or the US or anywhere else, you know, in the US's sphere, sphere of influence. And the 
the criticism from the OSS singled out this MIS spy chief named John V. Grombach uh, as being both gullible, and they said also that the tenor of his writings was kind of strangely pro-fascist, you know? Probably because it was written by Nazis, but, right. you know, but still, like, Grombach, of course, is incensed by this. Uh, he can be friends with anybody he wants. So Grombach responded, of course, by calling the OSS RNA department a bunch of dirty communists, and then immediately after saying this, told his men to go searching through Gellin's intelligence to find a way to prove that the OSS research and, and analysis department is, is communist. So as we know from our George versus George episode and, and others, there were indeed communist and partisan sympathies inside the OSS in certain parts and places and within certain groups, and particularly many of its like, you know, more reliable agents. Uh, he discovered in this case, though, that a mid-level employee of the OSS had probably been a member of the Communist Party 10 years ago, and if he was, he had failed to report it on his application. He also Ooh. found uh, a Francoist Spanish paper claiming that a State Department official was a commie and Russian spy and then brought it as evidence. This is from now this intelligence network that they're dropping so much money in. I mean, like, they could, they were actual fucking communists in the OSS, you know what I mean? Right. But he's, like, bringing out fucking clippings from a Francoist paper. And, uh, and also many of the research and analysis workers were college professors and a lot of them had like various sympathies towards socialism so that was you know all there too uh but again like pretty weak shit can you know considering how good gellin's group was supposed to be uh the real kicker though and, and what seems to have ultimately done in the oss was proof that the oss had downplayed reports of the massacre in Catton forest in like uh with an eye to sort of keeping allied solidarity in order you know um right in reality, that this happened. Like, OSS did downplay these reports, but so did fucking Grombach. So did his own organization in, in like, the same interests of Allied Solidarity at the time. But now, the fact that the OSS did it was proof that there was indeed, as Gellin was claiming, an overarching Soviet plot to take over American intelligence agencies from the inside and await their signal to strike, which is funny, because that's what the Nazis were doing. So this search was done in secret. Uh, and was given the code name Project 1641. The whole point of it being secret, I think, was so that he could leak it to the press and a select, now this is Grombach, leaking it to the press and a select number of these rabid anti communist Republican congressmen so they could like wave it all over the headlines and stuff, just as like budget appropriations for American intelligence agencies were being debated on the Senate floor. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. in response to this, the Senate uh, slashed the RRA budget of the OSS split it up into a bunch of meaningless subdivisions and like the, the last people that had other information on the Soviet Union that wasn't from coming from Gellin they just limped to like a quiet end with Truman signing it out of existence that year you know that essentially left Gellin's organization the only source standing on Soviet and Eastern European intelligence during this time so the Nazis had all of it more or less at this point so crazy yeah so so just to recap what happened there colonel john grombach got mad that the rna department of the oss said he was palling around with nazis feeding him garbage data so john went and found garbage data from his nazi pals and retaliated <laughs> by shutting down the oss ensuring that a bunch of nazis would set the tone for the next 40 years of american foreign policy and uh moreover simpson argues that grombach's purge of the oss was also the first shot fired in the period that we kind of sum up as the mccarthy era you know and the twist is that this al alliance between the american intelligence and the nazis will really be run by the the OSS that came back in the form of the CIA. Yeah, not the commie parts. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, those commie parts, you know, those people that we talked about, a lot of them were marginalized in this process because a vast majority, like, you know, you see some of that in, like, what happened to, um, oh, what's his name, Sterling Hayden and stuff. When, yeah. You know, he had, he had some of those, like, sympathies uh, for the partisans. And then, you know, his commanding officer was some, like, you know, New England aristocracy wasp who was just like, 
fuck out of here, like, <laughs> communists. Like, no. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is also the start of what ended up happening to, like, George Vucinich, like we covered, where, like, the fact that he was a decorated veteran and OSS operative, you know, meant nothing in the end, because, like, these guys through Gellin's organization helped shut all that shit down and and the only thing that was important now is that you were against communism yeah because the top brass in the u.s military and intelligence is from like this you know largely from this like upper class blue blood uh, oh yeah you know background who was always you know who were all always anti-communist and anglo-saxon anglophile yeah right and the ones that weren't like you know Balokovic's wife <laughs> became also pretty marginalized mm. as well. You know, like they went to like go live in Yugoslavia afterwards. So basically, what happens here is that like the the in 1948, the Czechoslovakian coalition government collapses because the U.S. won't support its like social democratic president because they think he's too much of a commie. So as a result, the Communist Party takes over, and this causes enormous panic in the US and with Gellin's like less than accurate reporting of 175 combat ready divisions of the red army ready right now to strike in Eastern Europe, uh, army chiefs of staff and senators and the American press were all like completely primed to accept everything that Gellin was feeding U S intelligence as complete fact. So none of these like stupid pinko eggheads at the OSS could like stop any of this information from coming through now. And Papers like the U.S. News and World Report had headline, uh, this is a headline of the time, uh, Russia at this stage is the world's number one military power. And this was like echoed throughout the media sphere and, and was the only thing anyone was talking about now. So uh, those of us who, you know, who have like normal ass white people, middle class parents <laughs> who grew up in this time uh, are definitely familiar with this narrative. And, uh, and I think it'd be fun this coming Thanksgiving, because it's close, uh, to just let them know that all of that came from actual Nazis. Uh, but the Truman administration responded by ending uh, post-war cuts to the military budget, like cranking up the budget, turning up the heat on the U.S. nuclear weapons program, and on top of that, dumping just millions of dollars into a bevy of intelligence operations, especially the brand new CIA, uh, which of course went to the Gellin organization, which was their source of Eastern European and Soviet information. So on the other side of the Iron Curtain here, Soviet intelligence was doing a pretty good job of keeping actually sensitive information secret, uh, which had the unfortunate effect of leaving a lot of vacuums in U.S. intelligence on the USSR because they didn't know what was going on because Soviet intelligence was doing an okay job. And so all of this got filled with like Nazi propaganda. Um, so the former CIA uh, analyst on the Soviet military said this in retrospect. The agency loved Gellin because he fed us what we wanted to hear. We used his stuff constantly. We fed it to everyone else. The Pentagon, the White House, the newspapers, they loved it too. But it was hyped up Russian boogeyman junk, and it did a lot of damage to this country. Yeah. So as we kind of finish here uh, in around 1949, let's just take a quick inventory of the information that Gellin was feeding, you know, America's adolescent deep state, and let's just see how well he did. So this is an intelligence estimate of what would be undertaken by the USSR in the uh, next like five years or something like this. So this was all from Gellin. All of this was accepted by the CIA, and therefore all of this was accepted by the American government and et cetera, et cetera, and press. So number one, uh, they expected... In this time, a campaign against Western Europe, including Italy and Sicily, but not the Iberian Peninsula, to gain the Atlantic seaboard in the shortest possible time and to control the entire central Mediterranean. They also believed that the Soviets were going to start an aerial bombardment of the British Isles. Uh, they thought they had a campaign to seize control of the entire Middle East, including Greece and Turkey and the Suez Canal. Um, they expected a campaign against China and South Korea and air and sea operations against Japan and the United States bases in Alaska and the Pacific. Uh, also, by the way, uh, the, the USSR will take over China and South Korea and make it into the Soviet Union. 
They believe that a small-scale one-way air attacks against the U.S. and Canada will start and possibly small-scale two-way air attacks against the Puget Sound area. Uh, a sea and air offensive against Anglo-American sea communications, subversive activities and sabotage against Anglo-American interests in all parts of the world. A campaign against Scandinavia and air attacks on Pakistan may also be undertaken concurrently with the foregoing or as necessary on a successful conclusion of the campaign in Western Europe possibly Scandinavia, a full-scale air and sea offensive will be directed against the British Isles, and the Soviet Union will have sufficient armed forces to undertake campaigns simultaneously in all theaters indicated, and still have sufficient armed forces to form an adequate reserve. So, as we all know, all of that happened. Well, I mean, like, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I don't understand how these people didn't look at, I mean, because we're, this is, you know, we're talking about after the Tito-Stalin split. How did they <laughs> see that happen and be like, the U.S., the USSR is the most powerful state in the world, yes. the most powerful military in the world, who literally couldn't do shit to Yugoslavia. Right. Which was, like, at that point, like, sure, had, you know, considerable strength in that, like, you know, their military came out of, like, the partisan movement or, or whatever, but, like, was pretty beleaguered and poor compared to, you know, the Soviet, the, the Red Army. Yeah, right? they didn't so even like, try to invade it or anything. And, yeah. and basically they were on the borders of Yugoslavia. So the, these, you know, they're saying that like the USSR is gonna like bomb the fucking Puget Sound and like invade <laughs> yes. America, yeah, and, like yeah. on their doorstep to have couldn't a, to do have shit a, about a, Tito, a global yeah. like a global military theater. Yes, um, yeah. So really good work there from the CIA's in-house Nazis. Uh, it, all of that was completely believed and came from the only real sources that the U.S. had on the Soviet Union. So that'll fuck you up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, we're, we're going to give uh, the book a rest here and pick up the story on the next episode. But before that, I just want to give a broad outline of what happens to the Gellin organization, like where they end up. Uh, they're, you know, I, I think, I mean, hopefully we can see that they were a profoundly influential kind of background figure um, that sort of sets the pace and the culture that we're, we're going to be entering into now in this arc. But uh, I don't know how much we're actually going to be invoking their name in the future. But they're there. They're there in the background, lurking, we'll lurking around. Again. <laughs> so, yes. So I mentioned earlier that the Gellin organization was housed at SS headquarters until about five years ago. Uh, so like, I, like we said in the introduction, uh, that after West Germany joined NATO in 1956, the Gellin organization simply became the, the BND. Uh, which I am going to pronounce as Bundesnachrichtendienst, um, which I prefer to call the Federal Intelligence <laughs> Service. And I'm sure our listeners might agree. So some German <laughs> listener just had a seizure. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, this, this was, became the official intelligence arm of the West German state. And, and, remains... and was Gellin himself the first head of BND, I think? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the Gellin organization was still in '56 a, a secret. Like their yeah. their existence wasn't ever acknowledged. And thanks to like their relationship to the CIA and all that, these Nazis were allowed to come home and officially resume their work for the fatherland. You know, war criminals or not. And while the origin of the BND is like better understood today, uh, to my knowledge, uh, maybe somebody can correct me, but there's never really been a reckoning here. Uh, with the fact that post-war German intelligence was like exactly as Nazi as it was in peak war, uh, in peak Cold War as it was under Hitler, you know, I mean it's the same. I mean, wasn't guys. that that was that was a lot of what like the German left was saying in like the sixties, you know? Yeah, but you'd expect like you know, so they're, all, they're all Nazis. They're all still there, and yeah. Uh, I mean, all like Merkel said when they moved the headquarters from the SS headquarters to their new building in Berlin was something like, um, we need a strong intelligence network now more than ever. Like, there wasn't, like, you know, here we leave behind the past and shit like that. I mean, know? that would be really too late to say something like that. A bit it's, late. It's a bit late in 2017. <laughs> yes. We're leaving our Nazi yeah. past in 2017. I mean, yes. it's better yep. not mentioned. Nope. So, yeah, so to close on, like, a wacky side note here in the story, um, despite... Uh, the BND being considered unparalleled experts on Middle Eastern intelligence in the 60s. The, the evidence that Colin Powell gave that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and you know, was an imminent mm -hmm. threat to the US, this was provided by none other than like 
these whatever Gelen types from the BND. Uh, mm. Like the president of the BND at the time told Colin Powell, probably don't trust this stuff. But I mean, this informant came from their house. Like mm. this was so an interesting, I don't know, interesting echo somehow, a reverberation yeah. into the 2000s. So yeah, that's it for our, our brief uh, vacation from Balkan shit. Uh, I had some back. like thoughts while I was listening to you. I um I remember how uh, Mike Judge of the um, That Is Just Around the Corner podcast. He has like these two ideas that he insists on um, about post-war uh, America uh, and the world. The first one is that the um, the Cold War can be seen as the World War Three, uh, which. I agree with because, you know, to call it a Cold War, you have to be very Eurocentric in a way because yeah. it consists out of many catastrophic hot wars, basically sure. in every decade of yeah. the so-called Cold War, you know, like the Korean War, the Viet War in Vietnam and many other smaller conflicts. So Angola for, you yes, know, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. The other idea that he kind of uh, insists on is that uh, the USA is the Fort Reich. So that's based on things like we discussed today, uh, which, you know, Mike Judge and other people would say possibly started with the so-called Operation Sunrise, um, yeah. which is when, you know, Alan Dallas of the OSS had secret negotiations with the Waffen-SS General Karl Wolf in 1945 about, like, the possible local surrender of German, German forces to the Americans. Um, although um, Alan Dallas had, you know, Nazi connections even before that. He had close business ties with the Nazis even before the war. I think there are some ideas that the Dallas brothers were also somehow involved in the so-called um, uh, business plot, which was this attempt to, coup, to do a coup against FDR before the war using right. some... Uh, American fascist groups and so on. So th these ties are deeper uh, between Alan Dallas and his crew and the Nazis, for sure. And so the idea is that, you know, uh, there was some kind of unification between the Nazis and the American deep state. And also a part of this idea that Mike has is that the CIA is the American SS, basically. Uh, a kind of a parallel state within the state uh, with, with, like, fascist ideology. So. I'm I'm like um, have problems with this thesis. So you know the 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 idea of of the Third Reich. You know the 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 guy who came up with the term was this like uh, fascist from Germany called Arthur Moller van der Broek. I think he came up with the term in 1920s. He was not a, like a Nazi Nazi. He was a, a like a as we talk you know one of these German fascist reactionaries who had his own ideas and kind of influenced the Nazis. Uh, but was not a, like a national socialist. I think he was close to Spengler and uh, yeah, friends with him, a kind of a similar guy to him. So the, the idea between the Third Reich was that, you know, the First Reich was the Holy Roman Empire and the Second Reich was the German Empire. And, you know, the Third Reich will be the future German Empire. So the, you know, the common denominator in this idea of the Reich is not Nazism. It's the idea of Europe dominated by Germany. Uh, right. So, you know, the, the Fourth Reich today would obviously be the European Union. Uh, like, that, that's basically the idea, you know, like a united Europe dominated by Germany. It doesn't have to be fascist because, you know, the first two Reichs were not fascist at all. Mm -hmm. um, so I would rather see um, America um, as a continuation of the British Empire. And, um, uh. you know, you, you can see the American Revolution as a kind of a British bourgeois revolution, you know, like unlike the French one, it didn't happen in the mainland, it happened in the colonies, but it created an, a British offshoot, a kind of a Republican Britain, uh, which is America, I think. And, you know, its empire uh, really blossoms at the end of the uh, actual British empire. And I think people who run it do see it like that, as a continuation of the British Empire. So, you know, we mentioned all of these people who, like Alan Dallas, and people who are in the heart of this story, uh, of this collaboration with Nazis, uh, like James Angleton, they're all, like, very open Anglophiles. Yeah, um, yeah. And they really identify with, you know, the British uh, Empire, cultural civilization, whatever you call it. 
and see themselves as a continuation of it. Um, so, and, you know, there is also um, this uh, idea, you know, of British supremacy also had its own um, relationship with fascism and, and specifically German Nazis and America as well. You know, there is, um, because um, uh, there is like a local American racism that influenced, you know, people like Adolf Hitler. It's not only that, right. you know, Americans yeah. adopted Nazi ideas. They influenced the actual Nazis, you know, like uh, right. uh, yeah, Adolf Ford. Hitler was inspired by American eugenicists and things like right. this. So there is like a two-way communication between them that, you know, was running for a long time. And you can also see that in, you know, things like when we talked about, you know, about these ideas about Anglo-Saxon racism, like we had a whole episode about British Israelism. So we saw that early on, the ideologues of this idea, they were open to Germans being a part of that uh, whole idea. You know, they, they, uh, they were open to Germans also being the descendants of the ancient Israelites and God, part of God's people, not only the Anglo-Saxons. It only changed when Germany formed into a Reich, an, an empire of its own that was a competition to the British Empire. Uh, but, you know, once you crush the Reich, you can also bring them back to the fold, you know. And I think that's, for me, a better way to see what was going on with this, the incorporation of the Nazis inside of the mm. empire after the Second World War. Not that the America became um, a fourth Reich, but it, it was more, I would see it as a kind of a Republican uh, British empire plus Nazis. So what you're Reich. saying, what you're saying here, Ray, is that the empire never ended. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, uh, I'd have to think about that a little bit more. I mean, I think... Uh, On its face, you know, I like points it. there. I, well, because, I mean, yeah, like, why, why, of course, wasn't Germany subjected to the same kind of, like, occupation and rule as Japan? Yeah. Uh, you know, they ultimately, yeah, saw Germans as, yeah. you know, one of us. Yes. Kind of. Yeah. Uh, did you not read Imperium? They were a, an American colony? That brutally repressed the natives. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, God. Well, why? Why, Yaki? <laughs> All right. Guys, what do you think? Any final thoughts before we uh, sign off here? Well, I don't know. Maybe, I, well, maybe you can cut this. I had one maybe just thought now, something like an addition to what I just said. But maybe if it's too much. Add it up. Just, Add it up, cut baby. It. Do it. Do it. Well... <sighs> A part of that would be, you know, the way that these, uh, these elitists, like Alan Dallas and that whole company, how they see Nazism. It's like, they like it, but they like it for Germans, not necessarily for America. So, you know, like right. Ezra Pound, for example, who was a great friend and even a mentor of James Angleton, you know, he was very enthusiastic about fascism in Italy. But when he came back to the United States, he said, well, we have our constitution. That's, that's good enough. You ha just have to implement it in the right way or how the British Israelis had this idea about Anglo-Saxon democracy as something for the Anglo-Saxons, not necessarily for anyone else. So, or how, you know, uh, conservatives in, in America say this is not a democracy, it's a republic. I think all of these things mean that this is like a thing for the elite uh, of the, you know, United States. So there already is this kind of a racist, elitist idea of how America should be run by the elites. They don't need Nazism. That, that's like, right. I think, an interesting, cute thing for them uh, that they have sympathies for to be implemented in other places. Uh, yeah. But um, they don't need like an op to have like a National Socialist Workers' Party of America. They have other things there, right. uh, how to run it. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a, what a lot of the discourse in the US when Mussolini came to power and how popular he was with certain segments of like the US elite were saying the exact same thing. Like we like mm. a lot of these like kind of corporatism, anti communist ideas that can be implemented. We don't need the dictatorship that's for Italians. You know what yeah. I mean? Like they need they need that because they're like unruly or whatever, but like, you know, American civilization's different. So, you know, they they pick and choose what they, you know, take from those ideologies. Because like actual Nazis and fascists as a movement in the U.S. were never, uh, you know, as great. You know, it never had the same kind of mass appeal. Yes. And the ones that 
had some popularity and it existed as we, you know, talked a lot about in the, what arc was that? Third arc, I guess? The beginnings of third arc, you know, they insisted on their ideology being Americanism. Even, you know, right. the, the Bund, like the, the most Nazi Nazis in America kind of said, well, we're like nas- not, we're not for German national socialism. We are for the American version of it, which is, we call Americanism. And that's based on this idea of democracy. So, right. And and a lot of these emigrant groups now that we're going to talk about in the rest of this arc, when they come to the U.S., they adopt that language as well. Yes. They all like you know, Ustash has become Democrats. You know <laughs> yes. what I mean? Like it just it becomes very like, you know, they they fully embrace the uh, like American anti-communist doctrines and adapt their language and ideology to mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you know to it, right? And so uh, and some of them pretty talk like talk about that pretty explicitly. Like you know, we'll get into that when we talk about. Like the Ustashev agrees, but some of them were like, "Yeah, we love, you know, we we all vote Republican. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is like proper anti-communism. Now we live here, and this is the model that we follow. You know, yeah. it's like before we were with the Germans, now we're with the Americans. But you know, like I, I forget, I think it's a, actually Luburich who says literally that mm-hmm. he says before we were with the Germans, we had that model. Now we're with the Americans. Maybe we'll go back with the Germans. But you know, like yeah, <laughs> they can pick and choose. Yeah, just as the Americans do." Yeah, and I think also just as far as the the America as the Fourth Reich thesis goes, I mean, you'd have to also account for the USSR doing like pretty much the same thing. Like mm-hmm. Beria also used a bunch of fascists and like Ustasha and stuff like that. And uh, and I also read in Simpson's book here that the Balkan Nazi finance expert Karl Clodius, um, who made a name for himself applying slave labor to Germany's mm-hmm. economic problems. He went on to become the economics chief of the common forms Balkan division after. So it's, it's like our, is then also the USSR, the fourth Reich. Well, also, you know, Kronoslav Draganovic, the guy who was most responsible for the red lines and smuggling Nazis to, he lived for decades as a free man in socialist Yugoslavia. Mm-hmm. Like right. s- yeah, when yeah. he, you know, so like a guy who was friends with Klaus Barbie lead yeah, as yes. a free man in Sarajevo. Yes. Like, Cause he became like a, what he was like, yeah, he ended up being like a triple agent at some point. Right. Like he, I think so. Yeah. The, the theory is, I think is that he ended up giving away, like he did all the rat line stuff that we're going to talk about like next week. Mm-hmm. But then in the sixties or whatever, in the f- late fifties in his old age, gave up some names to Yugoslav Secret Service who, probably for his own reasons, right? Because they had all that, like, internal beef in the Ustasha movement. Yeah, yeah. And got, probably got some people whacked for that, and then was, yeah, allowed to live normally and fucking died, you know, had a peaceful death and yeah, it's not a, yeah, in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these guys yeah. did. Welp. Uh, all right, guys. That's enough of mm-hmm. fucking Definitely, Nazis yeah. for tonight. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> got enough of that for a lifetime already in arc three. Oh god, yep. But there's a little Buckle more to up. come. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, yes. Buckle up. So we actually in the next episode we'll kind of connect more. The next free episode. Next free yeah. episode we'll try to connect what we talked about today with the rest of the arc in some way. Yeah, it'll be a little clearer. Yes. Yeah. And as for the patrons, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> If, if I have my way, we might be doing something very ridiculous, yes. but maybe not. Yes. We'll see. No, uh, yeah, I hope you have your way. All right. See you guys then. Bye. Bye. Fritz here from The Empire Never Ended. This has been one of our weekly free episodes for free people. But for premium people, we also have weekly premium episodes, which you can get at patreon.com slash tenepod, T-E-N-E-P-O-D. And also follow our various social media things in the, in the show description there. Like and subscribe them. Follow them. Like and follow and subscribe and follow them. Do it.